the super being, the thing which is greater than you, the thing which is traditionally called God. It's not at the beginning, because if it's at the beginning, you have all sorts of problems. Today's guest is Tim Freak, and we are definitely getting into some freaky stuff today. What the fuck? The universe is a mystery. How do you explain it? Well, there's an even bigger mystery there before it. And you're left with this, why on earth is there so much terrible suffering? You know, the whole thing, biology is based on things eating each other. I mean, the whole thing is just brutal. Tim first became well-known as a Gnostic scholar with his international bestseller, The Jesus Mysteries. According to Tim, the Jesus story is an allegorical myth encoding teachings that lead to an experience of awakening. This is what the original Christians called Gnosis. This podcast is a banger. Go check it out everywhere. Rumble, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Leave us a review. Leave us a like. Comment down below. And of course, if you want more exclusive content, master classes, and to join our community, wayofwilljohn.com is where it's at. Sign up is free for now. Enjoy the podcast. Peace out. Way of Will John. Welcome to the the podcast. This is one in which we um, we like to dig into to subjects that are rather, let's say, uh, ignored by portions of I would say our mainstream audience. So why don't you tell everybody at first who Tim Freak really is? <laughs> Tim Freak really is a very curious human being who wakes up every morning and wonders what the hell this is that he's experiencing and has the luxury and good fortune to be able to dedicate his life to trying to work that out. And that involves both um, a spiritual exploration for me, a philosophical, historical, scientific, um, and therefore I have a real desire to bring together our knowledge. I would say that's, you know, but, you know, essentially, you know, I'm on this strange journey between birth and death and, and wondering what it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you and us all, man. Uh, uh, but the the one of the reasons that we're we're here today is I I, I ran across the Laughing Jesus, uh, which is a book that you wrote. I'm not sure when. When did you write that? That's about 20 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So yeah, um, and a discussion about Jesus, uh, knowledge, whether Jesus was real, why we have a literal belief, and why the literal belief. Uh, became so popular over the years, which is something that I would love to get into. But first, I want to start with something possibly more controversial. Mm. Was the character of Jesus real, as we know him in history? Uh, I and my dear friend and co-author, Peter Gandhi, um, have come to the conclusion that it seems very unlikely. Um, and it is much more plausible to treat the figure of Jesus as a allegorical myth in much the same way that most people would treat the myths of, say, Krishna or in the, in the West of Mithras or Osiris and Dionysus and all those other figures. And I think as you kind of gestured towards, for various historical reasons, we treat this literally. Now, partly that's, you know, there's people, of course, that treat the myth of Krishna, literally. Um, uh, people treat these things literally. But what we've done with historical investigation now is we've been able to undercut that. This area is more difficult because, you know, if I came online and said, look, 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 we've looked into it and there really was no Dionysus, you know, it would be like, yes, yeah, so. <laughs> but when you do exactly the same thing with the figure of Jesus, then it's suddenly really controversial. But essentially, you know, if you, if you imagine, uh, this is the way that I started thinking about it when we first did our first book on it, which was 1999, actually, The Jesus Mysteries, was imagine that the, you know, huge numbers of Gospels were lost and have been recovered in the desert um, much more recently, in the, in the last century. Imagine the four Gospels that were in the New Testament were also lost. So we had no idea about any of this. And then researchers discover these gospels, and I came on this program and said, "Yes, we've we found these these stories of a man who's born of a virgin, who comes back from the dead, and walks on water." And and I don't think anyone would go, "Oh, that sounds like it's real." I think most people would go, "Oh, that sounds like a really interesting myth. I wonder what it means." 
and that's the place where I would, uh-huh. where I've ended up going. There, yeah, it, it it is what it sounds like, right? But that's not to dismiss it, Will. Okay, because it is a profound myth. Okay, and, and by profound myth, do you mean that there is profound meaning behind it, or? Yes, yes. I think it's. I don't. You know, our we kind of came through, and the and the laughing Jesus in particular was a. Uh, it was an, an, an it was a, a criticism, let's say, of literous religion generally, not just Christianity. And we came through at the same time as a lot of other people came through, or, or became new as the new atheists, for example. Um, the reason that we were different and that we didn't um, become part of all of that is because our our agenda was not to just dismiss it. Our, criti- our agenda was to go, look, there's something really valuable in here. It's just not what you think it is. And that's a different approach. I mean, the, the, Je- the Jesus Mysteries, which was the, the big bestseller, uh, we dedicated it to the Christ in you, which was not obvious for people who are, who are going, you know, Jesus didn't exist. Hopefully you are soaking up all of the knowledge from Brad. One of the most important things that I have learned interviewing all of these high performance leaders is that clarity of mind is crucial to your success. And what good is clarity of mind without clarity of sound? Which is why today's podcast is sponsored by Rode. We across Golaremi use exclusively Rode audio equipment in order to do all of our stuff. If you are an influencer, if you're just a person out there trying to make some good content for your stuff at home, wherever it is, Rode is by far the best audio partner we have ever had. We have been using their stuff for almost five years now, has never let us down, truly incredible company, especially with all of the other affordable things that you guys can get from them. Check out the link right down below and enjoy the rest of this podcast. And this is why your work has been so fantastic to me and so interesting is because I do remember the the period of uh, the resurgence of the of atheism and the bashing of this, uh, the Jesus is not real and God is not real. And, and that kind of, we went through this, uh, that maybe it was 2000, I don't know, seven, I feel like uh, around that time. I think it was in large part, what well, the reason it suddenly took off was in large part because when we were, criti- when we wrote the book you mentioned, our critique, of, it felt like, well, certainly when we did the Jesus mysteries, it felt like religion, it, certainly in the UK, was in massive decline. And then suddenly there was all this religious tension. We had 9-11, and suddenly religion was a hot to- topic again. And, and, it, and it, oh, it's not in decline. It's, it's still very, very much alive. One of the most fascinating things about all of this, for me, is when you, don't, when you decide that there, people go through stages, at least I went through a stage, and I didn't grow up in an overtly religious household, uh, but... You go through the stage of thinking, yeah, the, the born of a virgin, this whole three, what is the, like, it can't be. You're telling me that happened. I see nothing in my world that shows this to be true in a literal sense, but I have to believe that that happened and it happened back then. And then you go, that's completely, that's nonsense. Clearly that's nonsense. And that becomes, well, if that's nonsense, then everything is nonsense. And, uh, you know, there must be no guy in heaven with a beard you know, looking down on me, that's all, all this must, okay, this is ridiculous. And if you continue your search, though, you'll start to see that there's a whole lot of other things going on rather than just this literalist belief. It's either yes or no. There's some sort of, there's, there's shades and there's all sorts of meanings and there's all sorts of, uh, let's say, civilizations who have taken something and understood something and I think that's probably what you were getting into, and I haven't read the, Je- the Jesus Mysteries, but I know that if you've also written a book, which I had in my notes here, The Hermetica, Lost Wisdom of the Pharaohs, uh, and going down that in the Christ in you is telling a story about something inside of us that we all possess that is potentially what the authors of the Bible or in other great religious texts were speaking about. And so could you give someone an idea of what it is that was trying to be conveyed potentially with the Christ within you uh, that they're not seeing if they've just heard the literalist translation of the Bible. Yeah, so I think the essential idea is that there is a fundamental oneness of um, being, let's say. 
that there is there is a fundamental oneness that unites all of us. And in this way, it's not that different to a lot of other ideas we find coming through in a similar times in different areas of the world. You know, I think it, it, the the the, I, the idea in Hinduism of the Atman is very similar. The idea in Buddhism of the Buddha nature is very similar. Uh, you have similarized ideas of the daemon in some of the pagan philosophies. That there's something in, that, that your essential being, what you are, is one with what I am. And although we are also individuals, um, our spirit or essence is the same. So we're different. The, word, the, Greek, the Greek words that have used in all of the Christian literature is the pneuma, spirit, and psyche or psyche which is uh, soul. So we are individual souls, but we, we are one in spirit. And the, um, that's why when Paul says, you know, we are, we are, we are one body within, the, within Christ, because that is the one thing that unites all of us. Uh, and that's what they're trying to wake us up to. So that was, that was what the gnosis, the knowledge, essentially was, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and... If you get that, there's a very different perspective because it breaks you free from that idea that, which is now a, a very, very, you know, an idea which is hard. I think it's just a ridiculous idea that you, you, you need to believe that somehow God wrote a book or some book is divinely inspired. But it's this book, not this book over here, that this culture thinks that. That, that yeah. book's a lot of lies. Yeah. But our book, that's, that's completely true. It's like, yeah. well, why on what basis are you saying this you're just saying it because of the culture you happen to be born in there's no other there's no other reason uh so you you you, you tear that away and you go okay so what it's really this is by human beings first of all that means you don't have to swallow the whole thing that means you can take what's good and leave what's out of you know has been it, or out the crap it's no longer relevant <laughs> yeah. yeah it's no longer relevant yeah but you don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. you can keep what's of value and you can see what the essential thing they were exploring was. And that is, as you say, this, this gnosis, mm -hmm. how you can come to this knowledge, knowledge of God. It's really the essential idea you find in all forms of mysticism um, from that period, I think, is when you experience this, you know that not only you, you know you are one with God or there is something higher than you and you are one with it. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're all one. And that's what they're... Um, opening up to and that that is this experience of agape or love a love so big you could even love your enemies and if someone's watching this saying okay that sounds interesting you just said you can experience this how <laughs> well that's my main interest really um so i've been um i was uh, for whatever reasons i had a, an i've been ever since i was a kid the first experience was when I was very young, 12 years old, and, and something happened, and I would now say it was an experience of this gnosis. Um, and that set me on this journey, which is why I've written so many books on all these different spiritual traditions, including Christianity, drawing out this, oh, this is all pointing towards this experience. So, and what I've done for the last 20 years is gathered people together, and we'll, we'll, we'll do this in September in Glastonbury, um, not, you know, small groups of people because it then becomes more uh, intimate and you can make, make sure it happens. And there are ways in which we can come to this recognition of the place where we're all one. And when it happens, you you know, <laughs> you just know. And my experiences, and it's in every culture, whether it's here or Japan or Mexico or Croatia where, um, and, and all these different places, uh, is that it's much, much more accessible than people think. So the vast majority of people can have a powerful experience of gnosis mm -hmm. um, over a, the course of just a few days. Right. Now, that won't, that won't change everything forever, but it's a, it's a damn good start, right. and it enables you to go, oh, okay, right. So this is this. In, this and, and, and the telltale sign for me is always it issues forward, forth into this this what I call just big love, agape, or, or universal benevolence. Mm -hmm. You're seeing from a different perspective, and it's beautiful, actually, really beautiful. Are these, uh, am I making the assumption that you were leaning down the meditation path? 
in this or is there a daily practice that, you know, because one of the things that big things that we do, we have people like you who have spent so many years studying uh, in such a concentrated level and come out with, with, you know, being experts to some degree in, 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 in these subjects. People always want to know actual practical steps of what could be done. Is there any way to tomorrow start down my path before heading out to Glastonbury? Um, so, the first thing I need to caveat this with, Will, is to say that although my early work was all about articulating this idea of a perennial gnosis, which is there, a kind of commonality, what sometimes gets called the perennial philosophy, a common way of approaching this, you find it in the Hermetica, the Gnostics, also in the East, so forth, Taoism even. My, the last 20 years have been a different journey for me. It's, and and, and, and having, having articulated what all these other things were saying or trying to get it as simple and as clear as possible, I think what actually happened was I got it, got it so clear for myself and for my teaching that I saw what was wrong with it. Okay. And so that what's happened in the last, especially the last 10 or 15 years, is I've been looking at how does this need to evolve quite radically for the 21st century? Because what I like about the Gnostics or what I like about Rumi or Bodhidharma in, it, is actually they took what they found and they moved it on, mm. often quite radically. For their and, and this is an evolving thing. It's not like, well, they knew and we've forgotten. I don't think that's true at all. I think they took it on. They pushed the boat. They, they found more. And then it's up to us to keep going with that process. So what I'm doing is not the old Christian Gnosis at all. I see. Um, but it's it's a neo gnosticism in that it's inspired by them, but not just them. Also, all these other traditions. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered uh, about twenty four years ago, running these events for people, was that yeah, yeah, I mean, meditation. Which is what is that? It's just it's taking your attention and placing it somewhere, and discovering well. What is attention? What's consciousness? You know, what I notice is what consciousness seems to be, and this is a different idea to ones you'll find, you'll find in most of my books, is that I've, you know, I've changed my view on this. It, consciousness seems to be that wherever I place attention, I process it in high definition. Mm. So, for instance, I haven't been paying attention to my left foot, but I am now, and suddenly it's in high definition. It was, wasn't at all, and now it is. Right. Probably yours is too, right. and anyone listening, like, oh, left foot, <laughs> yeah. Suddenly, there it is. So when you take your attention, and then you can learn to place it somewhere, and if you place your attention deeply into something, very deeply, and, and you don't get distracted, and it's not because the mind's a bad thing, or the mind's a wonderful thing. But if you pay the mind attention, that will go into HD. <laughs> so, but if you want to pay something else attention in that moment, then you need to not pay that attention. So you can take anything, and like your breath, for instance, and you can focus in on it, and suddenly it becomes rich. I mean, really pleasurable, actually. Kind of, ooh, wow. And you can go so far into it, you start entering what I would call a state of communion, where there's an you you begin to be able to recognize this underlying oneness of everything. You can also then do that with the whole caboodle, with the whole thing, uh -huh. and you can start tuning into this thing which is greater than you, and that's where the big love kicks in. However, that was a very long introduction for what I actually <laughs> wanted to say, which was something else, which was the most powerful thing for me to bring in to high definition I have found is you. Mm -hmm. So what I do with folks is I get them paying attention like that to each other. So one of the very simple things would be, you know, if, we were, if we were together now, well, we are together now, but if we were in the same room at one of the retreats, uh, would be to sit you down with me or with somebody and go, okay, just connect with your eyes for some minutes. And what happens when you do that is you soon realize, oh, there's a face. That's amazing. <laughs> but what I'm connecting with is the psyche or soul. And I can't see that. I can do that with you now as I look mm. at yours. It's like, there you are, you're this amazing man. And yet what I'm connecting with, I can't see it. Mm. But it sure as hell's there. And suddenly we're connecting soul to soul. And if you bring that into uh, that same high definition, suddenly there's one of us. 
And if you do that, what I'll do, you know, on, on this retreat we've got in September, for instance, in Glastonbury, I'll, I'll, I'll get the whole group together. There'll be about 20-something of us, not, not too many. And you'll get to do that with everyone. We'll create a beautiful environment, a really, really you know, beautiful music, nice environment, because beauty is very transformative. And then you'll get to connect with every single person like that. And at first it can feel like, well, this is a bit strange. And then very quickly, very quickly, it's the sweetest thing you can imagine. And everyone is so beautiful. And you start realizing that other people are looking at you and going, you are so beautiful. And then suddenly you're just one together. You're not, you, don't, you haven't lost your individuality. It's a heightened individuality because you're now in a state of communion with each other. And that is the gnosis. Now, I think we need to understand it philosophically different to how it was understood 2,000 years ago. But essentially, the experience is the same, or development of uh -huh. it. Uh, how, how do things like dreams, lucid dreaming, these out-of-body experiences, how do they play a role? And in, in, in what have you found, maybe from the ancients, in their utilization of those things to connect either with that one or to change their you know daily lives or manifest to use that word uh, things that they would like yeah well i think you know what, what do we mean by spirituality is a funny old word isn't it, it, it and my simple definition of it of, of a spiritual experience is when you have an experience that there is more going on here than your socio-biological existence. And I, and I think your socio-biological existence is pretty far out. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's enough to blow your mind. But as well as that, when you have those, there's more. And what that's all, all of that is exploring this domain of the psyche or the soul, which is we're in it right now. It's not something separate or odd or we, something we go off to. We're in it. We're experiencing a non-material domain all the time. We're always experiencing body and soul. The, the simplest way to get that, the obviousness of that is, my body is making funny noises. But you're hearing meaning. But there's no meaning in the funny noises. They're just funny noises. But in your soul or psyche, that's where the meaning is. And So all of these things, the out-of-body experiences and lucid dreaming and, and a lot of the stuff that's people have been exploring since shamanic times is about exploring that domain and how it impacts on this one and a bit like exploring the biological or physical world you know there's continents <laughs> there's a lot to explore where do you want to go and the same with the with that it's huge where do you want to go are you drawn to that are you drawn to this do you want to do that do you want to do this and and uh, I've toyed with most of it to some extent. Um, I'm not an expert in all of it by any means. But, you know, I, I think these things all impact. Uh, one thing that I found, and, and I, like you, I, don't, I can't say that I had any truly transcendent experience. I, that's not true. I guess I did, but it doesn't have necessarily relevance to, to what we're speaking about today at a, as a young, at a young age. I had a, to explain it as simply as possible, Later in life, I've realized uh, that a lot of people don't necessarily know what they're supposed to do with their life or the meaning. You know, people can go to college. They can even, you know, have kids and a family and still kind of just be like, well, that's just what everybody does. Like, why am I really doing this? I, at around 15, I believe, uh, knew exactly and it was just, I was just, I knew, I knew why I was here. I knew, and it, it, time stopped. I, I understood. And having that clarity basically changed my young adulthood tremendously because I didn't have any really distractions. I understood what distractions were because I could just get back on my path. And so it changed everything for me. And I realized later on, of course, that not everybody had that level of clarity and what a blessing it was for me to have that at such a young age because people can go through their entire lives without understanding why they're even here. Um, and that's tough. Uh, and, and so what I... What I wanted to ask is, actually not on this subject, but people in trying to figure out what they want to do with spirituality, like you said, can use drugs uh, and things. Oh, we, I shouldn't just say the word drugs as if a, a plant or a certain thing is necessarily a drug. But let's say 
people use psychedelics, psychedelics, and different things in order to to utilize that. What are your thoughts on that? And as well as what did what do you, do you believe it it enhances, or uh, do you believe it's a deterrent or a distraction? I should say. I think it's the, the I think they're amazing. <laughs> um, uh, I've you know I, I'm here, I'm here to explore. That's what I realised when I was very young, and um, uh, so I have. So um, I I don't. Um, the older I get, the the less I, there is new things to explore. But um, certainly when I was younger, I uh, yeah I, I explored. Um, psychedelics and found it incredibly powerful and interesting um a lot of people i know have their first awakening experience in that way it wasn't that way for me um uh, and then there's been this influx of shamanic power plants and ayahuasca and peyote and all of these um bufo all which are amazing and very interesting again um my own particular you know, I know people who've gone very deeply into these things. Uh, my own path with them has been infrequent and sacred. Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense, and by sacred, I just simply mean that it's, it, you know, that it that it has import to the evolution of my soul, um, and that's been my way. And and because of that, I, my experience has been overwhelmingly positive. Not everyone's is. Mm -hmm. So one needs to be very careful. I think different psyches uh, are more fragile to these things. I'm quite strong, so it's been fine for me. Um, but it's hard. I mean, I hear people say ridiculous things. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, I remember going on a retreat. Do you know who Ramdas is? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I went, I went on a retreat when I was younger with Ramdas, mm -hmm. who became a kind of mentor of mine for a bit. And uh, I remember so vividly, there was quite you know, 500 people or something like that. And this, this question came up and you just saw this, the, the group just split into oh, those wow. going, yeah, psychedelics, yeah. And the other group going, no, meditation, oh, psychedelics. <laughs> and Ram just, just sitting there going, oh, God. <laughs> and I feel like that. I just feel like, look, and so anyone who says um, you can just experience all of this with meditation is probably lying and hasn't taken psychedelics because <laughs> <laughs> it's just not the same. Yeah. Um, uh, but conversely, then you're, you're still taking that from something outside of you, outside of your biology. So you haven't got, you haven't developed the ability yourself to shift your, your consciousness so much, but it can lead to that. You can mm -hmm. learn. Mm -hmm. Depends whether you become reliant on it. Right. I remember Terence McKenna saying to me, "Do you know Terence McKenna?" Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Good, good. I'm just checking because you know I, I, these people come and go, you know, and they're they're both dead, you know. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you know, I, know. I don't know. No, but, no. Um, sure. uh, Terence saying to me, um, "Oh, for heaven's sake!" He's saying, "You know, people say, oh, it's un it's not natural." He's always, "What's what's natural about sitting down with, the, with your eyes closed or facing a white wall? Right. Much more natural to bend down and pick up a mushroom." Yeah. So you know, I think there's lots of ways of seeing this. I I I, I think. I think the journey of life, there's something we all share, of course, but it's also very individual. And that's its beauty. It feels like existence has been 14 billion years to get us to this level of individuality. And that's significant. And so each person's journey through life will be different. And that applies to spirituality too. And the advice I would always give would not be do this. It would be learn to tune into your intuition with this. And follow that reflectively, though. <laughs> Don't just trust it, because your intuition can also be very wrong. You need to be, you need always to reflect and to come, you know, to to be to be willing to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always be be willing to be wrong. What do you think about our society's rather newfound obsession with technology? And I say rather newfound because it's been coming over the last few decades. Uh, but that's relatively new, obviously, in the space of you just mentioned 14 billion years for what the universe or however much we want to say. Uh, and in order to connect with that oneness and that you, and like you said, and if, if I'm following your train of thought, it's, you know, our attention matters or our attention slash consciousness matters and where we put it uh, is what we can have 
develop and and there's a big return, right? When you go into nature and you get engulfed by nature or you're sitting next to an ocean and you're yeah. just staring at this ocean and you just something weird happens to you, you know, and you can't quite describe what's going on. Uh, and so if we have this society who's moving towards technology, uh, it, which is not all bad once again, I think just like with the psychedelics, I think balance in all things is going to be your best friend uh, in, in order for you to delve into some subject. But what do you think if it says that we really overdo this, which to some degrees it seems like we are headed towards away from nature and more towards this? Where do you see that? Where do you see us going if we if we overdo it, or are we, in your opinion? No, I love it. <laughs> I think it's great. Uh, you know, human creativity, fantastic. You know, all of this. You know, I'm surrounded by it now, you know, the screen and the speakers and the microphone. All of this is the product of, our, of the soul. You know, somebody has invented this from images in the non-material, has then worked out how to adapt the material to make these seemingly impossible things happen. So you can be in one country and I can be a huge distance away and we can feel like we're in the same room and see each other and get connected. I mean, that's just amazing. <laughs> it's and beautiful. I mean, I do these, I do these weekly kind of meetups of, um, I have this little online community of people that, that come and we explore things, experiences and ideas every Sunday. And it blows my mind, Will, because we've got, we're doing gazing, for instance. I'll do gazing online. When I first did it, which I had to because of COVID, I had a group in Japan <laughs> with a translator. <laughs> and I couldn't go to Japan. So we had to do it online. I thought this is going to be impossible. It was amazing. <laughs> we were looking at a screen, but it was amazing because, the, you know, as, as you have a look, where is your soul right now? Well, it's nowhere, is it? It's not in space. So you can connect intimately even though your body's a miles away. And the technology allows that. So in our little group, there'll be someone, there's a lady who gets up in the middle of the five o'clock in the morning in Australia. There's other people in Sweden and South America and England, obviously, and US and all over the world. And yet we're all there gazing in each other's eyes. And it's like we're, we're, all, we're, we're intimately connected. So that's fantastic. You know, I love it that I was lucky that when I was young, we just arrived at the place where you could go into a bookshop and probably you could find the scriptures of the world, say, which is what I wanted to be reading. Now, I, I got them all here. What, 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 what fact do you want? What, 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 you know, body dharma, let's see. Let's, you know, it's like, what, it, I mean, these are fantastic things. Now, every time we do something new, there's always unintended consequences and we have to become wise with it and we will with this. We have to become wise and there will be lack of wisdom and that's obvious as well. But overall, I think we're extending the soul into matter and, and that, that's, I think it's, it's exciting. Uh, you mentioned, uh, obviously, everything that we have around us is coming from a thought or an idea from the non-material world. Have you given any thought or made any conclusions into understanding the nature of reality? In a, in, a, in a way that isn't necessarily taught in, in school. Because I can't even, I, this conversation never happened. I went, to some, I went to some okay schools. This sort of conversation was not happening. Uh, and so could you maybe give uh, someone an idea of what is potentially happening when I first think I want a sandwich from that to, you know, or even something more obviously profound and to, I want to change my life. I want a new job. I want to, a mm -hmm. life, a family, how that process is happening, how you can actually affect that with your attention. Well, let, let, let's go for, let's go for a, a massively, crazily big vision okay. and see where we end up. So this is what I spend my whole days doing, Will. So it's, you know, this, this is, I've been doing this before I talk to you. I'll do it afterwards. The, what is this, this thing we're in? What the hell is it? Well, what I notice is that, and I'm going to say a lot of obvious things, but the obvious really interests me, is that it's always new. It's always slightly new. And so therefore, the, the first place I go with it is, well, maybe that's what this is. Maybe this is the formation of new things, of novelty, based on the past. And the, the, the reality 
is a process of forming. It's a process of new things coming into form. And it's an emergent process because the new thing has to include the past thing, but will always be more than it. And that that process has started with the simplest things you can possibly imagine, which is what physics now points to, that, that if you go to, to the basement, as it were, of reality, it's information, like this computer, you know, it's information. And yet from that, this forming has taken place into the physical universe, and then at least on our little planet, probably elsewhere, but here, you've suddenly got life, which a whole new level again, and then from single-celled life, multicellular life, and then the ability to pay attention with in, in high, high definition, consciousness, sensation, and then the arising of the psyche or soul, which is, when I look at it, is made up of images from my sensory experience. And yet that has taken off to such a degree that it's a, it, it's a bit like the internet, you know, it starts with a tiny little thing and the next thing, you know, woof, well, the psyche's like that. <laughs> you know, the psyche hasn't been around in terms of the, you know, 14 billion years of evolution for very long, but it's just huge. It's just doo -doo 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 -doo. the ideas, the number of ideas that we have, we have used just in this conversation, let alone the ideas that enable us to use the computer. And it's like we live in this huge matrices of ideas and the better our ideas the more we see and the more we can do and the more creative we can become. So it looks to me like the universe has become conscious as us. It has enabled itself to reflect as us by having ideas with which it can understand and discriminate and discern and differentiate what is this, what it, what it isn't, and that we can reflect on them to improve them. And whenever we do that, it keeps moving forward and forward. And not just in terms of technology, but also in terms of how we live together, the fact that the world is so much kinder than it was in history. You know, as an historian, it's shocking place history. You know, it's just shocking. And it, it makes you feel proud of human beings that we've got from that to this. Doesn't mean there's not a lot further to go, but it is amazing that the world, the, the world we've created. So what's happening, I think, is that we now... Our attention is now in this non-material domain, primarily, the psyche or the soul, and developing the best ideas, ideas with which we can understand what this is and transform what this is, make it better, and that's what we're engaged in doing. And spirituality, for me, the big, the big transformation in my understanding of spirituality, which I'm, I'm working on this big project I mentioned um, when you first invited me, and I was reluctant to come because I was so busy, <clears throat> for the last eight years, has been working towards a, a philosophical project that I'll give away on the internet. <clears throat> um, probably in September it'll be ready to start. Which is going, look, the, pr the, the old Gnosis is all based on the idea that there's a pre-existent super-being of some description. We've fallen from that into this illusion of separateness, uh, hence all the suffering, and we need to get out and get back. I think that's wrong. <clears throat> I think it's the other way around, and I think that's what science has given us. Science has given us some key ideas which can help us understand spirituality in a new way. One of which, the big one, is the universe is a process of evolution, of emergence. And if we take that on board, I think spirituality, far from being an eternal realm we've fallen from or anything, anything remotely like that, is actually the latest level of emergence. The psyche is the last big thing that's arrived. That's why it's so amazing to explore. That's why when we connect psyche to psyche, it feels incredible. So the simple... And there's a lot, but there's a very simple message. I'll, I'll just say one more thing. But the, the simple message is that this is a process of forming. There's physics, there's biology, and then spirituality is about the most emergent level. It's not, it's not a byproduct of biology. It's not to be dismissed. So we need to take that scientific narrative and extend it beyond the physical and go, there's also the non-material, isn't there? Look, you're in it right now, and it's huge. And that's the next level of emergence. And it's all one process. It's not supernatural and natural. It's all natural. It's just that the, the, the... 
And then the last idea I'll just throw at you, which is because a big idea and I happen to love it, is that is that the the that the the super being, the thing which is greater than you, the thing which is traditionally called God, it's not at the beginning. Because if it's at the beginning, you have all sorts of problems. Like it doesn't explain anything for one thing, because they've just got a bigger mystery than when you started. The universe is a mystery. How do you explain it? Well, there's an even bigger mystery there before it. Like, okay, you haven't helped. So it doesn't explain anything. And you're left with this awful kind of like why on earth is there so much terrible suffering why you know, the whole thing biology is based on things eating each other i mean the whole thing is just brutal why and and you're left with and the craziness it's like if there was some intelligence would we have five complete extinctions i mean it's not that intelligent is it <laughs> you know so it doesn't make any sense which is why i think thinking people have increasingly gone off oh, forget that idea but my experience is there is definitely something greater than me and it's incredibly benign and loving. So what I'm exploring now is what if that's not at the beginning? What if that's actually where it's going? What if that's the latest thing to arise? And that when souls come into communion with each other, they form something greater than themselves, just like my body has come about because cells have come into communion with each other and form something greater and it's when we enter those that the gnosis is when we enter into that communion and become part of something greater one of the most important things you can do if you're trying to earn more money is learn new skills stacking skills is one of the greatest things you can do in order to bring value to yourself and the people around you especially one like learning a new language i bet most of you guys had no idea that i could speak nine languages and that we have a youtube channel with almost a hundred thousand subscribers where i do exclusively just that and we break down the method for exactly what an idiot guy like me has done in order to do this it's not complex it's not complicated and most of you guys have probably used the traditional method and the traditional method sucks that's why you can't speak any spanish after four years of going to high school and taking spanish we can week out. If you want to learn to speak a language the fastest, easiest, and most natural way, click the link right down below. Golaremi Languages, we've got the method for you. Check it out. Right to say, I'm going to, I'm going to bring us back a little bit because <laughs> I want to, I want to, to touch on this, this as a, as a giant subject, even to make it in a more practical sense, I'm going to bring us into a, the realm of conspiracy just as a thought experiment. Uh, because you mention, uh, let's say, loving the uh, technology or obviously using it and, and, and having it uh, around. What about the idea that if we can't, and this is, I'm repeating stuff, not necessarily that I believe, but that is out in the zeitgeist right now, uh, that if the phones, the, the, the TikTok and the rest of the social media is stealing my, stealing in quotation marks, my, my attention, I can't necessarily have that transcendent experience, or can I? Because from what it appears, I don't know this, I don't know if anybody's using necessarily technology or scrolling mindlessly. Can you, can you scroll mindlessly and then happen upon your being, the supreme being or the, the, the end or uh, this, this greater, this, this sense greater than you? Or, or does it take silence or does it take is, is there a conscious process to it and so I'm kind of that's where I'm, I'm kind of to, to know and to, and to get to is uh, is each individual going to have to gain control of their attention in order to have this thing move forward and have an experience like this well it can just happen mm -hmm. um, it can happen because you scroll mindlessly and I come up and go hey <laughs> 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 all sorts can happen yeah yeah but the key thing, I hear what you're saying. Mm. Look, this, this, is, this, this is all, you know, it's only happened yesterday. I mean, I, mean, I, 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 I lived most of my life before any of this existed, and, and now suddenly it's everywhere. It's like it, it's, it's only just arrived. Mm. So, of course, we don't know how to handle it. But it will force us to become aware. Now, if you don't have much faith in human beings, it is mm. easy, and a lot of people don't, then it's very easy to go, oh no, this is the this is the one. Now we're now we're we're yeah, fucked. Yeah. You know, now it's like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. over. But people always say that. 
You know, every new technology, oh, the television, that's the end now. Oh, the radio, that's the end now. Well, let's go back. The book, that's the end now. All right, yeah. And when the, when the printing press first came out, people would publish pamphlets about how the, you know, in England, about how the Napoleonic French were eating their, killing babies and mm -hmm. eating you know, all terrible things. And everyone just believed it because it was in print. But it didn't take that long for people to start going, oh, just because it's in print doesn't mean it's true. Aha, now we have more sophistication. You look at adverts from the 1950s. Buy this, it's really good. Yeah. Oh, it must be true. <laughs> now yeah, you just look at it. Yeah, right, <laughs> yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We get sophisticated, you know, and then the next level and the next level. And the same thing will happen with AI. The right. same thing will happen with all of this is that we will start going, oh, you can't necessarily take things on face value. And that's good because it requires us to reflect. Now, the interim period, there will be like, oh, God. But it will lead us to reflect more. It will lead us to go, hang on, what am I doing with my attention? And, and so I, I think there will be always problems. But in the long term, I have faith in, you know, we have the universe, it, the whole process has got us from 14 billion years ago. There's mainly just hydrogen, just a gas. Now there's you and me having this conversation. Right. That, that's pretty impressive. So that process of, and then the human history has gone from people treating each other in ways that are unbelievably, un you know, like routine brutality of an unspeakable to us really moving on from that. So I have great faith that we can keep that process going. Uh, and you said, obviously, one shouldn't blindly follow their intuition because it can be tricky, uh, and, and which is so true, right? And critical thinking, I think, uh, is something potentially that we are missing out on right now, or it seems to be <laughs> not as valued um, or not as taught, not as spoken about, not as trained, let's say. And, um, and how does someone do that in a practical sense? Or how do you do that in your life, right? Because if you have, and, and you're doing this uh, on, on a daily basis, you're, you're touching into your intuition. How do you manage let's say left brain logical thinking that says, well, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. Therefore, why would I listen to the right brain? And it's crazy nonsense about what, what is possible or what could, be, what could be done. How do you weigh both of those together to make good decisions? Well, I think the intuition and, the, and my ability to reflect are all part of one system. And they, they're both r work really well together. And the reflection enable you know, what, reflection is a very interesting thing because, well, you're a footballer. I bet when you're playing at your best, it's just happening. Yeah. It's like, I mean, you know, it's like, it's, but to get there, I bet you had to do a lot of reflection. What am I doing there? What am I doing there? Let's try that again. Until you can just do it. Uh, same with a musician or anything, really. Driving, anything. So reflection actually is counterproductive. It slows things down. It's, it's, uh, it's time-consuming. It's energy-consuming. But it enables you to improve how you're processing. So if you're making if it's a trivial decision, you don't want to get lost in procrastination. But it's a big decision. You need to stop and reflect if you can. And the intuition will give you... Like, it will give you a sense of sometimes you don't know why you even have it, but you know you have it. And my feeling is take that very seriously, but do not regard it as some divine revelation because it's not. It is also you trying to work out what this is and what you should do about it. It's just that it's a particularly strong insight into that. And sometimes it overrules all the other things for me sometimes it's like no nope, i'm following that but you can reflect and arrive at no nope, that's the strongest mm -hmm. that is the one i don't know why but that is the one but it's that ability to stand back and look at it and so the key thing i think is is starting to enjoy being wrong you know and it's been interesting for me i've come out whatever it was <clears throat> 10 years ago or something now less actually with some of it and had to go oh i've written 35 books 34 of them were, were wrong in some important ways and it's very interesting to see people's reaction because some people were like, 
very attached to what I'd said before and they really didn't like it. Yeah. And other people were like, wow, that's unusual. And it really struck me, oh, it's unusual, is it? Oh, because you'd think that we were constantly going around going, oh, I just discovered I was wrong. Yeah. And, and the big, sh I mean, I'm 65, Will, and the last five years, my 60s, have felt like seeing I was wrong, seeing I was wrong, seeing I was wrong, about thing after thing, and reevaluating my life, going, whoa, okay, right. And mm -hmm. some of it's a bit shocking. But once you go, oh, every time that happens, I end up in a better world because I can see clearer, I understand more. You start to look for it. Yeah. And you, you start to seek it out. And that's what I do. And, and I have the luxury to be able to spend a lot of time doing it. So, so for me, it feels like, well, I'm a philosopher, which is somebody who works with these ideas. So I get the luxury to do that, and then hopefully I can work out how to think in a different way, and I can give it to people and go, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And then it bit like somebody can like you know you can you give what you give that person gives what they, we all give different things and and so it's not like everyone has to be socrates you know you don't that, that would be terrible just follow your own path but be reflective and and look for those don't defend your old structures of ideas be willing to to learn and, and be open, have an open system, not a closed system. That was that the simplest way of putting it. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's becoming ever more clear to me as well that a life well lived is one in which reflection has to be a part of your process. Um, and like you said, I mean, it, it's amazing, right? You know, you, you hit your 60s and you <laughs> each year you're just going, wow, 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 wow. Look at what I see, look at what I can do, look at how much more I understand and all that, and that's, in my opinion, the way it should be done, and it starts early, and, and I'm, I'm shocked, and I'm always shocked. I knew things were changing in my life, and the things that I've been able to, to, to achieve and to, and to go, when I, the time frame between, as a, whatever, a teenager, I might not really truly reflect on what's going on in my life, it might be like a year, you know, before I'm really like, wow, what happened, you know, uh, you know, and then slowly, throughout my early 20s, I started really pushing it more. And it started to be six months, then three months, then two months. And when you start to have this process of reflection and analysis and to kind of sit and stop, because it's, it's really hard to stop I was, <laughs> and getting more increasingly as uh, there's so many distractions, so many different things you can do, you start to notice I'm almost, you almost get embarrassed at, at who I was, not because of the things that I was necessarily doing, but the decisions and the thoughts that I was having that I'm like, this was ridiculous, you know, and I, I'm, I'm sure you've probably come across that, you know, as well. But it's just so fascinating to me that that's not part of our general understanding of what it is to live. And, 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 and you're right, it needs to be. I mean, these are all things, you know, I, I, for me, it's like, oh, what I'd like to see in the education system is not teaching people dogmas or anything like that, ideology, but teaching people above all else to think critically. And there's more of it than there was. You know, it's like one of the things which we need to avoid is the idea that we were once doing this. We weren't. You know, we, we, were, we were once even more ignorant. <laughs> now, there's always been a, individuals and little groups are doing it. And that's why things have moved on. But we haven't, you know, it's not like, oh, well, we were like this before and now we've stopped. No, we've never been like it. But we need to start being like it. And we can encourage each other to do that. And part of that is, this, like I said, it's having this, having an open ideational system whereby you're not the, the, well we started this conversation with the idea of, of fundamentalism in religion that's a great example of a closed system it, nothing comes in nothing goes out it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's hermetically sealed bad use of hermetics because <laughs> hermetics is an open system but yeah. you know it's sealed <laughs> and and the, the great thing about evolution is it favors openness and evolution with the thing which has got us from hydrogen to you and me having a conversation has all happened through creativity and creativity is what offers some something new something new something new so that where that's happening now is in the world of ideas and everything that we're surrounded by as we discussed earlier is an idea that somebody has brought into the world uh you wrote a book jesus and the lost goddess yeah i believe 
Yeah. Could you could you touch on that? Because I guess the full mm-hmm. name is uh, Jesus and the Lost Goddess: The Secret Teachings of the Original Christians. Yeah. And from what I can see, and I, obviously I haven't been able to read read the book yet, but you're discussing Mary Magdalene as well. Yeah. Uh, is is she does she port, is she portrayed as the lost goddess within this? Or Yes, well, it, it's a book I'm very... It's, it was the sequel to The Jesus Mysteries. So The Jesus right. Mysteries was a real in-depth look at the history, you know, saying, look, the, here's this myth, uh, which is basically a reworking of older myths in a revolutionary new way. And all of the motifs that you find in the Jesus story, you can find most of them in ancient pagan myths. And they've been, and, and that's no, you know, that sounds outrageous, but it's no different than going, if you go through Star Wars, you can probably spot where he's got all the ideas from. It's like, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, it's like, of course. And it, it, that, that's the same. The ancients were the same. They, they didn't have cinema, but they did have myths. So that's what they did. Um, and then there's the question of what does it mean then? What's, what's the underlying allegory about? And, and, and I, I think all of the myths, the pagan ones too, are in different forms allegories of the spiritual journey. So Jesus is every man. He's you uh, on your journey. Um, and the figure in the ancient pagan myths is not just of a uh, father and son, God as father, God as son, which is what you get obviously in Christianity, but it's also God as mother or goddess as mother and daughter. And what's interesting is that the conclusion that Peter and I came to was that the Gnostic Christians, far from being later heretics, were the creators of the Jesus mythology. They were the original Christians. Mm. And that they, in in their other Gospels, of which we now have a lot, Mm. there is also a mother and daughter. And that is Sophia, often. They have different names. But the two aspects of Sophia is one of them. Um, And in the Gospel story that most people know that is represented by the two Marys Mary the mother and Mary Magdalene who is the and and when we talked earlier about the Christ being the spirit or the pneuma which is where we're all one that is represented by the male principle and the psyche or the soul is represented by the female so that um, in in terms of the God the father God the father is is the the, the pneumatic presence from which everything arises and the, the goddess is, is all form. So when I talk about it forming, she's that. Mm-hmm. So we're in her now. She's everything, mm-hmm. every touch, every color, every... It, it, you think of the ancient, in the, the Egyptians knew it, the night sky is the goddess. It's like everything within the cosmos is her. Um, uh, but it's also, so it's all, all form and it's soul, but it's your soul. And the idea here, the one that I want to revise, but the ancient idea is you've fallen and Mary Magdalene is, is the fallen soul. And she is purified by Jesus by the seven demons. And that's, we know it today as the seven chakras. It's actually an ancient idea of the seven planets, um, which you get also in Mithraism and in ancient paganism. So she's purified and then she becomes uh, the wise soul. And she becomes, in the Gnostic mythology, she becomes the uh, teacher of the disciples after Christ dies. She, she's the wise soul. She discovers that the tomb is empty. And she then teaches all of the foolish men, actually, in the story. <laughs> and, and, and the men are the, are the signs of the zodiac. That's the 12, the 12 around Jesus. In fact, one of the Gnostic Gospels, you see him standing in the middle leading a dance. And, a, and, a, and he will call out and they will, ref, there's a call and refrain. And these are the 12 signs of the Zodiac, which you also get in all the other traditions. Uh, so the idea there, which people again today probably know more through the East than they do the West, but it's, the, it's also, it's the Western tradition from Pythagoras, is that your, the soul is on the, on the wheel of grief. Mm-hmm. And it's going round and round, incarnating on the wheel of grief. And it needs to get off the wheel by going to the center. Which, which doesn't move, and that's the uh, spirit or the Christ. Uh, so I, I have a friend named Matt LaCroix. Uh, he is an archaeologist. He's been on the, the, the show a, a couple of times, maybe even two or three. He's, he's coming back on. And we had a discussion off air once about 
these connections that you're just describing right now, um, the correlation between the 12 disciples and the 12 signs of the zodiac and the chakras and seven, and, um, and the, some of the other pagan myths that are clearly before uh, the, the formation of the, the Bible as we know it. My question to him and, uh, is the same to you. With an understanding that this is the case, very likely we have a, we, we understand quite well these you know these these records on this. Do you think that the average person would have a hard time shifting from our fundament, fundamentalist materialistic belief system that we have to really getting? I mean, the connections between astrology and ancient peoples and that it wasn't just a way for them to understand that they should, you know, go on a date on a Wednesday because Mercury is, <laughs> that it wasn't, maybe it wasn't just about that, that it had a much larger role and there was something else altogether going on. Do you think that this would be a hard thing to accept in society if we were to just say, hey guys, front page, CNN, Fox, this is actually more likely what it was. All that other stuff yeah, it probably didn't happen like we said as, as pure history. Do you think we would have an issue with that? <sighs> different people, different things for sure. Collectively, hard to tell. Um, I, uh, what strikes me though in response to what you're saying is... I mean, firstly, it's been interesting to me. I mean, the, the Jesus Mysteries was not written in 1999 and I still get messages all the time from people going thank you 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 set me free and what's lovely about it it's and is that it's people who are going it's great i'm reading more than one book that's one of my favorite things that people say often <laughs> and and it but they haven't it, what hasn't happened is that someone's come in and gone taken it away they had this lovely thing and now it's all gone it's like no that hasn't happened and because what we're saying is, look, there's, there's something better here than you think. It's not some history thing you've got to believe in, and if you don't, you'll be punished. It's actually a sublime transformation of the self, which you can, you can enter into experientially. And you end up, and you can talk to Jesus as much as you want, because Jesus is that in the psyche. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a, that it's a these, are, these are not trivial things. It's just not an historical story. Except that the sad, the sad thing is, you, you, is that very often it's um, none of my friends and family talk to me anymore, and that's the sadness, is that you know you break out of a cult, and it, it's a closed system. But more generally, with what you're saying, what I want to respond well is to say that's why I've given up, really, you know, my life actually, to trying to articulate an approach to spirituality which keeps the essence of what the, why the experience is so important but integrates it genuinely with our current, with everything else we understand about the universe and is able to go, look, it's not woo-woo and it's not supernatural. It's just an ex the, the extension of the natural. And we can take all of these things which seem like they're crazy and understand them in a new way in which they're not crazy. And if we can do that, then, well, it'll change if that were to happen. And I think it, well, something will happen. Our, our, the idea that in my TED talk, I ended up by going, look, a new understanding is coming. And it's not controversial. Of course it is. New understanding is always coming. The question is, what will it be? And it won't be this. So what's the next thing? Well, we had the, the scientific revolution. Scientific revolution came in, didn't mean to because they were all good Christian men folk. You know, they, they came in and they ended up going, this mythicism is nonsense. And they, they got rid of mythic religion and they gave us science by going all of that supernatural nonsense. My hope and my, I, I do think this is likely, plausible, is that what will happen is that you can't, because that's actually addressing a level of reality, it isn't just nonsense. It's, a, it's not only a level of reality, it's the most emergent and in a sense, more, most important level of reality, it will come back. 
but it has to come back in a new form. It can't come back in a mythic form. That is finished. It can't come back as new age. Blah, 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 blah. That's finished. It will attempt to do that. It can't come back as just an eclectic mishmash. No, that's none of that's good enough. When it comes back, it will come back as a new thing on a new level. And when we do that, then it can be on the front page. And, and after enough people have gone, oh yeah, that makes sense. Suddenly it will be common sense. I want to I wanna discuss a little bit about the, let's say, secret societies, uh, esoteric nature of things, because the Gnostics, they become this, and as we know, the Gnostics weren't a, a sect. It's a, it's a bunch of people, right, and, different, and a belief and an idea, and, you know. Uh, but now, as you said, you know, things evolve, they, they change, and we have on Earth now at least a belief as well that there are these secret pockets of societies or secret pockets of the of of earth and people who have potentially greater knowledge uh, hidden knowledge and you know esoteric you know just meaning and the occult meaning to be hidden what do you take of that do you do you think that there is a anything that can be hidden or is hidden or is this a matter of the fact that just because the majority of the race isn't putting attention on these subjects and these things they're not finding them, they're not understanding them, or is there truly something to that? So first of all, you're right, that no, no Gnostic called themselves a Gnostic. That's, that's a retrospective label for people are so disparate, very much like today, you know, if you say, like I said, New Age. It's like, well, who are we talking about here? Because it's like, there's, there's you know, some, some of the Gnostics were aesthetic, some of them were into proto-communism and sex, and <laughs> so it's like, there's a whole range of them. Um, but secret societies stem from oppressive cultures. And the reason they're secret societies is because if you're not secret, you will be dead. That's the reason they're secret. And that goes right back to the mysteries in, in Greece when they started up. Because I, I, and my take on that would be it's because, they're, because actually they're an Egyptian import. And that is heretical. So it needs to be secret. And that become, becomes huge, and then it's not really, it's an open secret, but, uh, for instance. And then with the triumph of the literalist Catholic Church, to be a Gnostic is, you know, you're going to meet a very unpleasant end. You know? <laughs> you're going to get burnt to death, and I mean, the horrendous things happen. So if you want to follow that, you need to be, it needs to be secret. All right the way through to, you know, if you're a Jewish group in studying Kabbalah and you know, all of that, then you need to be very careful who knows. Um, so I think it's just simply that. So the idea that there's some secret knowledge, you know, having been around a lot of these groups, there is people keeping alive another tradition, often in my view an interesting tradition and an outdated tradition. And the idea that we're keeping alive the secret knowledge is as much a closed system as everything in the Bible's true is a closed system. And and there's a romance around keeping it, you know, it's like, why do you need to be secret now? <laughs> you know, uh, that I find a little bit, you know, troubling. So so for me, it's like, yeah, look, look, look we need to, let's get all the wisdom of hum, human beings out on the table and we can draw the best from all of it and let's see collectively where we can synthesize it into one narrative because we've got this idea you know if i said to you oh well the chinese have their own scientific story and it's different to ours it's like well no that can't be right can it science is science it's got you know it's just one story right we, we may, may not know what it is yet or people may have different opinions but but there's and then we, but because of trying to cope with all of these closed religious systems we've developed this idea of like oh well this is a common knowledge and that's just you know, whatever. Yeah, just go off and do your own thing. Just stop killing everyone else, and as a way of dealing with that. Well, so once you get rid of that, then we can open up. We're studying a level of reality here. So when we, the closer we get to understanding it, the more commonality there will be, and the more we'll agree with each other. And we have to be willing to look together to, you know, what to to to, to link it with what we were discussing earlier. See, I feel like the book you read, The Life of Jesus, is a critique of religion, of literalist religion. 
and I think it's still playing a pernicious role. It also does good, of course. There's always two sides, but it, it, in in its closeness, it, it plays a pernicious role in the world. Mm. But it it can't be replaced by science, and the reason it can't be replaced by science is because people are having genuine spiritual experiences. And unless they're given a better understanding of what those are, and it's not just dismissed, then it can't, then they'll always, then it will never be able, you will never get rid of that. The mythicism will continue. Also, just as an aside, I don't know, I don't, I'm, I'm wandering a bit here, but it seems interesting, I think you'll enjoy it. It's like one of the things that strikes me about our current dilemma, where we've got the leftovers of mythic religion, <laughs> and we've got let's call it reductionist tendencies in science. So that, and it feels to me that they're both making the same mistake in opposite ways. And that's the clue to what the next understanding needs to be. And what I mean by that is, what is mythicism? Well, essentially I think what it is, is it's taking ideas from the human level and applying them to levels which aren't human. So, if you go, oh, at the beginning there was the intention of God to know himself, or there was a something, you know, or, or you know, it's a big fish with a whatever, you know, it depends on your myth. But yeah. you, you're taking things which are about this high level of human, huma of, of intention and planning and all of that, which is going to take 14 billion years to arrive, and you're putting it at the beginning. Well, there wasn't any of that. These, even these questions don't make any sense. And that's what science has done. It's gone, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. We need, to, we need to see, we need a different language. Actually, the language of mathematics is what makes sense of this, what Pythagoras saw that. Mm -hmm. But science has done the same thing in the opposite direction because mm -hmm. it then goes, oh, the language of mathematics, of physical laws, that really explains my love for my wife or your for your child. Mm -hmm. That's really just the outplaying of this physics. Well, no, it's not. It's on another level of emergence, it, which is just as real, but more emergent. And it, so it's reducing everything to the wrong language. And mythicism is, reduce, is reducing things to the wrong language. And what we need is the whole spectrum to understand, yeah, if you go down d deep enough, it's just information. That's the language you need, mathematics. But when you come up to here, you need the language of love. You need the language of spirituality, of art, of all the things that make human life so rich and you mm -hmm. can't it can't be reduced it's more than the whole process of forming is constantly more than just like this moment is more than the last one you know th this moment includes you inviting me on oh yeah. and right. you learning to speak and me getting born and the evolution of the human species and it's more than more than more than mm -hmm. uh or this this idea of more than are you familiar with who thomas troward is too? Do you know no. the name? Thomas Troward. I guess you could consider him and you could lump him in with a new thought, but it's, okay. you've now said a phrase uh, two times in this idea of that there's always more than. There's a, he has a famous affirmation, which I, I will send to you after. It's, it's a small paragraph, but it, it really um, it, it has a almost direct correlation with the way that you believe. And, and for many people, he was the ultimate new thought author because of the fact that he actually didn't, he did not want to get mired, and we're talking about the, the late 19th century uh, mm -hmm. here, I believe. Uh, he didn't want to get caught and mired in what was going on at the time, which was uh, these closed systems of, we are part of the Golden Dawn uh, community, and we want to do this, and we're theosophists, and we're, he didn't want to get caught up in that, and he felt that it wasn't necessary. Not that they didn't have some form of value to them, but that it wasn't necessary. And he had this belief that things were always evolving to be more, and that the universe, that was fundamental to its existence, that it was always seeking to create and go more, and to build it on top of what was from the past into something greater. Uh, and so there I'll send it to you. Yeah, but thank I, I you. Thank you. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate it. His, yeah. his works now, on the other hand, which are uh, incredible, just requires such a level of concentration right. uh, <laughs> that, that I would not, based on the time that you have available to you, I would not dive into those. Thank but you. to your point on the, the problem of science, I just wanted to touch on this because it's something that I also feel is an issue, uh, is people are still having these spiritual experiences, or not even necessarily spiritual in that sense. They're having things happen to them that they can't explain. 
and science is saying that it does have an explanation for it at certain times and points. You know, it was just flashing things. This this electricity hit here and hit that, and boom, that's what happened. And we see we can touch this part of the brain and we can create that experience for you. So therefore, we know what it is. And uh, it, it's always been troubling to me because I have also had interesting meditative, uh, you know, I experiences. In which case, it would be very hard to to convey this in just in just numbers and even words themselves are lacking in able to, to, to put across what you can experience in some of these altered states and different levels of consciousness. And so I find that to be an issue for going forward for the materialist worldview uh, yeah. in how, how it's going to deal with that. It's because it's never going to, it's never going to be completely solved. No. Um, and, so here, since we're, we're just about closing up here, I, I'm curious, and I always ask, you've written plenty of books, ones of which we've spoken about plenty also on here, so we'll link to those. But I'm curious, just for you, based on everything that we've, we've written, which one of your books would you recommend, number one, uh, to someone who wants to, get a, to go deeper into this? And number two, any books that necessarily that were a big influence to you in your growth uh, into the viewpoints that you have and, and are having, what would you recommend? Uh, well, loads of books have influenced me, but most of them mm. I disagree with. So um, I might duck out of that one o only because, <laughs> you know, they're part of my evolution. But um, sure. part of that evolution is being going, oh, I don't sure that's right. Um, in terms of my own books, um, I do think the, the Jesus stuff, which we've talked about, is still relevant because it's historical. And it's interesting to understand the... Um, what they were saying but the, the my latest book which is a few years old now which is soul story evolution and the purpose of life which is the beginnings of what i'm going to articulate um what i am articulating now so and then uh, and in terms of the experiential side uh, probably the book before that deep awake um but the the, the the best thing is you know if people can is come to the uk and and just hang out with me for a weekend mm -hmm. or online on a sunday um, and see what you experience. Um, and, and, then, and then I'd want to say, you know, if people are intrigued to know whether I can actually come up with the goods on this idea of the universe forming, um, it is going to be a big project. I mean, we're talking about 40 hours of audio, I expect. Um, uh, then they, you know, just sign up to my mailing list or on YouTube or wherever, because then you'll hear when it comes out, and then you can see for yourself, and you can tell me what you think deal listen tim it's uh it's been great everything i expected it to be i knew that i would end up with more questions and things here that i would uh, eventually have to go to but listen if it comes if it's coming out in september and if time does permit we'd love to to get you back on to that is a to discuss it more that is a date will i've so much enjoyed meeting you it's been a great awesome. conversation let's definitely do that all right then uh, so guys, if you're listening to this, the links to everything are in the show notes. And if you're watching this on YouTube, it's in the description box and Tim, we will see you in September.